Well, again, good morning. It's so great to be here. It's good to open God's Word um, with you today. And, and all I can say is this, buckle up, right? I mean, this is, this is one of those places, I mean, obviously we believe God's Word to be true, but there's no way this would be in the Bible if it wasn't God's Word, right? It's just a, kind of a crazy scenario that I think sometimes it can feel a little bit unrelatable because it is so bizarre, um, but my encouragement today as we look at this text is, 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 is really this, that, that we're all a little more like this man uh, that has a legion of demons than we might care uh, to imagine. And so as we look at this uh, text today, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going I'm to do it interview style, and, and, and we're going to be asking questions of a man that's been changed by Jesus because the text kind of lays out really the story arc of every person that's ever been changed by Jesus. And that story arc is this is that we were all lost before J Jesus ever you know, met us, before we ever encountered him, and that we were found by Jesus, and that we were sent. And so uh, before we get into that, one of my favorite pastimes, if I get kind of sidetracked and I'm wasting time, is to watch uh, failed TV interviews. So check this out real quick, because this is fun. I said, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. Because then I start to taste them. I said, and then I start to smell them. So it's like a smell that tastes like I was like, So I knew something was wrong. I knew something special about it. You know? So So what did you do when you heard the intruder? I ran upstairs. I had to run. And I had to do with that little girl. What's that little girl uh in the Holocaust? She had a uh she was Ann Hathaway, Ann Frank, <laughs> Frank and Beverly, Ann Frank. I had to get up the stairs. So he had so much rhythm when he was walking upstairs that doom, doom. Doom. I started to almost beatbox up in the closet. Oh, boom, boom, boom. But I couldn't do it yet because I couldn't die. I got caught tomorrow. What did you think about the ride? It was great. And apparently, I've never been on live television before. But apparently, sometimes I don't watch the sh I don't watch the news. Because I'm a kid, and apparently every time, apparently Grandpa just gives me a remote after we watch the Powerball. Hey, Lily, actual customer out here. Uh, what's uh, what's the best kind of firework to buy? Wouldn't you like to know, Weather Boy? <laughs> Where are your parents? I just kept hearing it. I'm ducking and everything. Died in the house. I'm I got scared. I dropped my hot pocket. I then just got an awesome face paint job. What do you think? I like turtles. I like All turtles. Right. That's a good You're one. Great zombie. And good times here. Today, Flossie's My favorite family right here. is going to be coming out here to throw you a big birthday party. Are you excited for your party? Not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good. Anyway, that has nothing to do with Jesus, but it's good to laugh together. Um, we're going to interview the scariest man in the Bible today. And we're going to ask him what happened, how his life changed, and what you're going to discover is that he's far more relatable than maybe uh, you first imagined. And so if you're a note taker, here's where we're going today. Three points. I was hopelessly lost in my sin, is what he'd say. It's what we would say too. I am miraculously found because of Jesus' mercy. And thirdly, I am purposefully sent because of his heart for the world. Uh, our big idea today, kind of the thing that everything's aiming at, is this right here. Is that in light of God's mercy, no one is beyond the reach of grace. So let's dig into that together. We're going to look at our first point. If you've got your Bible, I'd love for you to open it up and track along with us. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. You know, here's what I think this man would say if we were to interview him, if he were to look at his encounter with Jesus. I think his story would be something like this. If we were to ask him what, what his life was like before Jesus, it would be one of isolation. It would be one where he'd say, hey, the city, everyone in the city uh, had expelled me. I'd, I lived in a graveyard. I was in a, I was in a cave. Uh, I, I was unapproachable. I was unbearable. No one wanted to be around me. That's what his story would be until I met Jesus. And the thing that I want you to notice about this text is that Jesus took his disciples through a storm, and we talked about this last week. It was the scariest storm that these guys probably had ever been through because he had all of these experienced fishermen on the boat, and they think they're going to die. And so this storm on the Sea of Galilee must have been really something. But the question is, why did Jesus find it necessary to cross the Sea of Galilee when a storm was coming in the middle of the night? The entire reason that Jesus crossed the sea was for this man. 
and he left right after he healed this man. Listen to the text. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea after the storm, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to, to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying aloud and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. You see, so interesting, this man... And the demons that, uh, that, that embodied his soul knew exactly who Jesus was. I mean, as soon as Jesus steps out of the boat, the very first thing this guy does is goes and he finds Jesus. The Gospel of Luke tells us that this man used to live in the city. Now, now what you got to know about this encounter is that, that the Gospel of Mark tells about it, but also Matthew and Luke. And we get some different details from those Gospels as well. Uh, it says that he had been exiled out of the city because he had become so unbearable. Um, and, 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 he, and, he, and he'd been exiled into this place where there had been tubes uh, and graveyards because the land wasn't really good for anything else. It was, it was, it was near a cliff. If you go on the Sea of Galilee, you, you, can, you can go by a boat and you can kind of see the area where, these, where he probably was talking about. Uh, the Gospel of Luke also tells us something very interesting. Not only was this guy like out of his mind, cutting himself and screaming, he was also, wait for it, naked, Right? He was naked, right? So, I mean, can you imagine a more terrifying picture? He had an unclean spirit, meaning that he was demonized. To call to your memory um, what we talked about back in May, let me just remind you of, of kind of some nuts and bolts, some demonology 101, of what, what is true about demons. Because I think um, mainstream culture can influence our ideology and even our theology about what demons are and what they're not. Uh, more than we're aware of. So let me just draw this to your attention. Demons, what we talked about in May was this, is that they're fallen angels that sinned against God that now continually work evil into the world. That they have power and control and influence in this world, but only so much as God allows it. And we're reminded in Job chapter 1 that before Satan can tempt Job, that he has to ask God for permission. So it shows the power that's always existed over evil. The primary targets of the enemy and his demons are about distorting our identity as image bearers. I mean, think about this guy. He was barely recognizable, right? Didn't even look human anymore. Now, they also work through more subtle ways of getting us to believe lies and accusations. The scriptures say that, that he's the father of lies. He's an accuser of the brethren. And they try to get image bearers to believe anything about ourselves, God, or others that is contrary to the word of God. That's the main goal of the enemy. So, so now that we've got that backdrop, back, back to our story here, this, this man was deeply oppressed by the enemy. Scripture says that he was, he was demonized, and everything about him was offensive, especially to Jewish religious people. He, he should have been unapproachable or considered unapproachable to everyone. I mean, c- could there be something more offensive uh, to these Jewish men? I mean, he lives in a graveyard. Um, uh, he, he's naked. He's broken every foot shackle and handcuff that's ever touched his body. He cuts himself with broken rocks all day long, and he screams out loud continually. He's the most terrifying person in the Bible. So what does it mean to be influenced by evil to such a degree that you're considered to be demonized? Now, your, your, your Bible probably says demon-possessed, right? Um, and I, we, could, we could say that. The thing I don't like about the phrase demon-possessed, one, it's not in the Greek New Testament, okay? Demonized is the word that's in the Greek New Testament. Um, but demon-possessed also has this, it kind of has this finality that's attached to it, right? Like, like you can't actually change, um, and, and also, when you hear the, the phrase demon-possessed, we drum up characters, caricatures that are so outlandish, and that phrase, you know, doesn't give the opportunity for change. If you're like me, when you hear demon-possessed, you think about uh, that time that the guys that led you to Christ 
when you were 14 years old, snuck you into the church in the middle of the night and forced you to watch The Exorcist. That happened to me. Yeah, crazy, right? Exactly. I, I'm still not able to sleep. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a dark night for me. Um, I guess it was a rite of passage. I don't know what they had in their mind, but I, I trust that you have better friends than I did. Um, but in all seriousness, this is, how, this, is, this is part of how evil, how it works in the world. So we need to be aware and have a category for it, right? Um, Sam, my friend Sam Storms, uh, he wrote about it, and he says it like this when he talks about demonization. He says, every case of demonization involves someone under the influence or control in varying degrees of an indwelling evil spirit. The word demonization is never used in the New Testament to describe someone who is merely oppressed or harassed or attacked or tempted by a demon. In every case, reference is made to a demon either entering, dwelling in, or being cast out of a person. Now, I know it freaks us out to think that the power of the enemy can be such that he takes over a person's soul. Um, and while there's mystery about this, here's, here's what I know to be true. There's way more going on in the spiritual world than we ever give credit for, right? There, there's so much happening. There are principalities and powers, as Ephesians 6 talks about, and we don't give credence to that at all. I think this is a reminder for us that there's more going on than we could see in this world. And Jesus has power over it all. This, this, evil, spirit, this evil spirit in this man, uh, they're, they're so inflamed by the presence of Jesus that when Jesus steps his foot on the shore, the man immediately approaches Jesus. And this is characteristic of what we see in Jesus' ministry. Every time that he meets someone, it's, 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 it's like they approach him, right? Because they are so aware of his power and his presence. Jesus has power over evil, and he exercises it at will. I, I believe that the evil spirit inside this man, this legion of demons, and, and a legion of demons uh, means this. Legion was a Roman uh, military word that meant a group of 6,000 soldiers. And so when this, when this, when this uh, demon speaks to Jesus and he says, uh, my name is Legion for we are many, he's saying there's a, mo I don't know if there's 6,000 demons in him, there was 2,000 pigs. I mean, there's a lot of demonic activity going on in this man's heart in his soul, and in his mind. But he's begging Jesus not to torment him. Matthew 8 gives us another interesting take on this about Jesus' power uh, over evil. It says this in verse 29, And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So what does he mean about coming to torment uh, these demons before the time? Well, the word for time here, there's two Greek words for time. One is chronos, which is kind of the time you, you tell on your wrist, the time that you look at on the clock. It's, it's kind of chronological, right? Um, and then there's kairos time. Kairos time is a, is a, is a moment, an appointed moment in history um, that, that, that is significant. And this word here is kairos time. And what he means here is that there is a, there is a moment in history where Jesus, where Jesus will fully and finally exercise his total binding authority over evil and all of its influence in the world. That will happen. Now, the, the question is, what are we dealing with today? If that's the promise that we have and that will happen, what, 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 what is the power of evil today? Well, Revelation 12 gives us some helpful insight into this about his influence in the world today. Revelation 12, 12 says this, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. So all the description of demonic activity in the Gospels and our own experience in this world is all because he knows his time is short. He knows that Jesus is coming. The question is, do we know that Jesus is coming? The question is, do we understand the power, do we believe in the power that Jesus has over the evil that's in this world? So coming back to this man again, the image of God, as I said earlier, was so distorted that he was barely recognizable. He didn't even look human. That's how far sin had taken him. And that's the design of the enemy in our lives, is to distort the image of God so deeply in us, in, our, in the way that we think about our appearance, our characteristics, and our qualities, that we don't even reflect God anymore. 
Now, we look at this story and we're tempted to think, thank God I'm not like this guy, Legion, right? But I think this is the wrong response to these verses. Why? Because before Jesus comes to us, we are all like Legion. Maybe not just like him, but we definitely reflect him. The Bible tells us that if you're in Christ, you, that there's two places to be, either in Christ or under the power of evil in the world. First, First John 5 says this, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Those are the two sources of influence on my life and yours. And you see the enemy's influence looks different in each and every one of us. What is your before Christ story? What were the BC days like for you? Like what I did there? What were the BC days like for you? How is evil influencing you? Because I think sometimes we can think, oh, that was back before I was a Christian. I'm, I'm never tempted like that anymore. We all know that's a lie, right? We're still tempted. Evil still hunts each and every one of us. Maybe you're like me, and you and your life have been an incredibly angry person. Here's what the scriptures say about that, even as a believer, right? Right? Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. You see, I think sometimes we think, ah, oh, you know, I just kind of flew off the handle a little bit. It wasn't really that big of a deal. No, you were reflecting the devil when you were angry. We don't think about it like that, do we? We don't think about how evil influences us, how Satan and his demonic forces seek to distort and twist the image of God in you and to kill all of the fruit of the Spirit in you. Or maybe before Jesus, all you could think about is yourself, advancing your own agenda, protecting your own reputation. The world might say, oh, those are just bad character traits. You'll grow out of those. Or maybe here, uh, here in the church, people see you as a pretty good person, but your reputation with those at work, in school, or on your team is that you're not a kind person. What do the scriptures say about someone who uh, says they're a believer uh, and behaves that way? Well, as, as in, the, in, the, in the church at Ephesus, as Paul was writing to Timothy about spiritual leadership, here's what he said about those kind of behaviors. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.6 says, He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he might not fall into the disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now we would hesitate to call conceit. We'd hesitate to call, you know, if you got a bad reputation with those you work with, we'd, we'd hesitate to cause, to, to say that that was influenced by the devil himself, wouldn't we? The scriptures do not hesitate, friends. The scriptures say that they are all character, uh, characteristics of people who are more influenced by the power of evil than the Holy Spirit. Now I'm not saying if you're excessively angry, that you're demonized, but you might be. I mean, maybe I was, I, I don't know. All I know is that now, as a believer, when anger surfaces, it absolutely terrifies me. And friends, just this week, I, I'm just like you, just this week, my anger got out of control toward one of my children, and it terrified me. I didn't know I was capable of that. Do you know what your heart is capable without the restraint, capable of without the restraint of the Holy Spirit? Evil hunts us. We cannot forget what it's like to be lost. We cannot forget what it's like to live this life without the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. What is your story? What does lostness look like in your story? You might be in the midst of it right now. Or you maybe, maybe you hear this and you recall to mind something you know, a time when you weren't looking for Jesus and he crossed the sea just for you like this man. You see, because your sin has never stopped Jesus from showing up for you. It's never stopped him. But the question is, do you remember what it's like to be without him? Because that's what leads you to treasure the gospel with all that you are. Life in Jesus is not about managing how lost you look. It's not about judging others for how lost they look. It's about remembering that we are all lost without the miraculous grace of God redeeming us, church. Amen. That's the story of us. That's the common bond that holds us together. That's what keeps us in Christ. 
But the second thing that we see in this man's story is this, that, that if we were to interview him, he would say this, I am miraculously found, not because of anything I did, but because of his mercy alone. If you're in here and you're a follower of Jesus, it's because God was pleased to show you his mercy. And what do we mean by mercy? Well, it's, it's been defined like this, that, that grace is getting what you don't deserve, while mercy is getting, not getting what you do deserve. Friends, what we deserve is to be left like legion for the rest of our lives until we die and we eternally go to hell. That's what you deserve because we are legion. We are far more like him than we'd ever care to imagine. So Mark 5, 8 says this, for he, Jesus, was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Isn't that just like Jesus? To draw so near to someone so evil and ask such a personal thing, like what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. You can just hear the torment in that, can't you? And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country, the demons. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and drowned in the sea. Now, uh, some of you guys like deviled eggs. This is the first case of deviled ham in the scriptures, all right? <laughs> Somebody told me some other joke, too, that was pretty funny. They were like, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a suicide or something like that. It was funny. It was good. It's good. There's a lot of jokes here. It's good. Everyone in the story is moving away from this madman, everyone. Jesus is the only one that is drawn to this man, even after he tries to push him away. You know what that reminds us of? The fact that when, when God sets his love on you, there's nothing you can do to stop it, nothing. So Jesus, imply, uh, he, he simply asks, what's your name? And, and he's interested in the man, even his demonized past, and he's drawing out his marred identity with something so Personal, right? So, so what's, the, what's the deal with this pig exorcism? Well, there's a lot of mystery around this. He could have been, so he could have been setting up uh, basically an example of how, of how uh, Jesus delivers us from evil. You know, maybe it was a, maybe it was a, a foreshadowing or, or, or a picture of like what happens uh, on the day of atonement uh, when, when, when the, the scapegoat is sent away from the camp. I, I don't know what it was, but I know there are three things that we have to pay attention to uh, in, this, in this story. And they're this. The first one is this, is that Jesus is turning the economy upside down for this community. Like he is pleased to so disrupt this community with the gospel that, that everyone is frustrated and mad at Jesus, and they tell Jesus to leave. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine Jesus performing a miraculous miracle in my midst and then saying, hey, get out of here, Jesus. I think one of the reasons was is because of the cost to the community. It reminds me of that story in Acts chapter 19 where there's this guy named Demetrius, um, where, and he's a, he's a, he, his business is that he's a silversmith, and he, his kind of bread and butter is making idols, pagan idols for the community. Well, uh, the, the, the community's transformed by the power of the gospel. Guess what? They stop buying idols. Demetrius gets very frustrated, starts persecuting the church. It's kind of a, an example of what happens. Um, the gospel disrupts everything about us, friends. Even our finances, right? So I think we got to pay attention to that. The second thing is this. Nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Nothing. I don't care how much stuff you've got. I don't care how much you love your pets, all right? Nothing <laughs> is more valuable than a human soul. I mean, this lady at Home Depot tells me she understands, this is a few years ago, what it's like to have four kids as I'm, I'm hauling my kids around getting two by fours. She's like, oh, honey, I know, I know exactly what it's like to have four kids because I have to take my four dogs to the park every week. It's just the same thing, isn't it? And I was like, you have got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> not the same. I'm not saying pets don't matter, but they're not made in the image of God, friends. Nothing more valuable than a human soul. If it's worth Jesus' life, it's worth our time and sacrifice too. Amen. The third thing is this. When you have an encounter with Jesus, 
you have no idea what will follow. You see, the, the truth is, if we're really followers of Jesus, we all got our own pig testimony, right? <laughs> it's probably not this one, at least not in the stories I've heard so far. Maybe some of you can surprise me. But if you're a Christian, you've got this kind of pig story. You've got this testimony of how Jesus has changed you. When is the last time that you thought about how lost you were before Jesus? If you're in a season of your life where the gospel is just kind of routine, it's not really bringing joy to your heart, it doesn't really, when you get out of bed in the morning, you're not thanking God for his mercy, maybe you've forgotten what it's like to be lost. Maybe you've forgotten what God has done to rescue you and save you. And and if you struggle with that, like I do sometimes in my life, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer that I am 100% confident God will answer. That's, That's a pretty bold thing to say, right? I am so certain that this prayer is in his will, though, so I know he'll answer it. And it's this, Lord, show me how lost I am without you. He will answer that prayer. And when you, when you hear the answer to that prayer, remember that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And he, he desires to commune with you as you abide in him. That's what makes the gospel more beautiful than anything in our lives, church. But this story doesn't stop there. And you know, Jesus is not afraid of the darkest parts of humanity in the world or the darkest parts of your heart, whether you've confess them or not. Jesus desires to exercise his great power to set our hearts free. What would, what would need to happen for you today to make your desperation known to him so that you can treasure the gospel more deeply? The third thing we, we see happen is that this man is sent. So he's, he's lost, he's been found, and now he's sent. And what I've discovered is that's what's true of every single person that has the power of the Holy Spirit alive in them that's following Jesus. Listen to what Mark 5 says. Verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and they saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. you got to get out of here, Jesus. And he, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. I can just imagine this man clinging to Je- Jesus. Just let me be the 13th disciple. Let me get in the boat, right? And Jesus says, I love the world too much to let you come with me. I love Decapolis. I love all of these Gentiles that don't care about me at all. I've got to send you to them, Legion, whatever his new name is, right? I've got to send you to them. For I died for, I'm going to die for them as well. And he says this. He says, go home to your friends. I mean, even that phrase, go home. Where's home for this guy? He's lived in a graveyard, as far as we can tell, right? Go home. That phrase in and of itself would take miraculous faith. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis, these 10 cities that were around this area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Few observations about this as we land the plane here. It's hard to believe that evil people can change, but they can. We hear it all the time, don't we? People don't change. We can't trust him. We can't trust her. They're just going to do the same old thing. They're just going to burn us. They're just going to hurt us. We can't trust people. And this is true for the most part, unless the Holy Spirit is involved. Because when the Holy Spirit is involved, anything is possible. I know because he's changing my heart, friends. And I'm watching him change many of you in this church. And when the Holy Spirit takes hold of your heart, you will not be the same. He changes everyone that he touches. Every genuine follower of Jesus, as Ephesians 1 says, has the Holy Spirit. It's not this second thing that we're waiting for, like this graduated gift that you get after you've been a Christian for a while. You get the Holy Spirit upon your profession of faith. 
Do you have a category for transformation when you think about others in your life? Do you have a category where you say, you know what, I think God could change them. Do you have a category in your own heart for transformation? Some of us are so boxed into our rutted, sinful lives that we don't think God could ever change us. What would it look like to let light in to that part of your story? What would it look like to believe that God could actually change the thing that you think is unchangeable? Do you actually believe that God can deliver you from your struggle with sin? Now, Jesus heals this man, and he is the exact opposite of what he was before. He's sitting, he's clothed, thank goodness, right? And he's in his right mind, and people cannot believe it. What would it look like for you to believe that God can change you and others in the same way? Second thing we see is this, is not everyone wants the gospel even when they see it. People are afraid of Jesus because of how believing in them might change their lives. They didn't have a category for this. They begged Jesus to leave. Believing in Jesus is not a matter of just having information and evidence. It's not, it's not about just knowing the facts. It's a matter of having a heart that's been made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love what 2 Corinthians 4 says. Here's, here's how Paul writes about what it looks like for a heart to be transformed. So, so if, you're in, if you're in here and you're thinking about, do I really treasure the gospel? Do I wake up and really think about, like, the most important thing in my life is that Jesus has made me alive. If you struggle with that, here's, my, here's what, what's probably going on in your own heart and life. He says this, he's talking about unbelievers here. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim, Paul says, is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If you want to be able to see, to really see the things that really matter in this world, he said you see it through the gospel. That's the most important thing about us. And it's, it's when we're living in that blindness is when we're trying to see our lives and make sense out of them with, with any other set of lenses than the gospel. The most important thing about you is that you are worth dying for because Jesus loves you. That's the most important thing you can remember today. That's what gives you worth. That's what restores our identity. And this is why we can never forget the legion in our own soul. Lastly, every Christian is on a mission to tell of the mercy of God with their lives. Now, the beautiful thing about the church is that we all get to uniquely tell the story of mercy, don't we? Because we've all been redeemed in different ways. We've been freed from different things. This man is rejected by the people who knew him, yet accepted and known by the God of the universe. So what's the natural desire? <laughs> Let me go be with Jesus. I'd love to be with him. And the crazy thing about this whole story is that Jesus grants every single request that this man and his demon-possessed self asked. I mean, from... You know, from Jesus leaving to him letting the, the demons go into the pigs. He, he answers all of those requests except this one. Except this one. And he says, you've got to stay here because I've sent you here. And think about, this is the craziest thing about this whole story. This man is the first commissioned missionary in the Bible. This demon-possessed Guy, this, this demonized, scarred, lunatic Gentile was the first person to be sent out by Jesus for the sake of the gospel. And his life told the story. Jesus says, go home and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Friends, my question to you is this. What has the Lord done for you today? What would it mean for you to go tell the story of the mercy of God on your life? Who is waiting to hear the gospel from your life? Amen. Who's waiting to hear it from your lips, from your life? What is your Decapolis? This passage makes us think of the cross as we're turning to the table here. Because on the cross, 
Jesus traded places with demonized people like Legion. On the cross, he cried out with a loud voice to his Father in heaven. On the cross, he was naked and bloody and abandoned, and Jesus was driven into the tomb. And he did it all to confront the evil, the evil that confronts each and every one of us. And he did this because no one is out of his reach. May we never forget that we are just like this man with a legion of demons, and nothing will stop Jesus from rescuing us. May we go and tell others of how much God has done for us.